another quick reference, uh, and then I'll move on with this, but another quick reference about being blind is from the wonderful Brazilian film Central Station that won an Academy Award about a decade ago or so. And it's about a woman who sits in the Central Station at Rio de Janeiro and writes letters for money. She writes letters for the illiterate. And somebody needs to write a letter back to the countryside or a letter to a landlord, and she writes a letter. One day, in the beginning of the film, a guy comes to her and says, Dora, I have a job for you. If you would take off work tomorrow, I'll pay you $100 to go to this address in Rio, which is a complicated city, and bring a 10-year-old boy to this address where a rich American will adopt him. And I'll give you 100 bucks. So what's to lose? Next day, she takes off work. She goes and gets the boy. She goes through all this complication, delivers him to the district, gets, gets her 100 bucks, and goes back to her apartment, but on the way buys a television set. As she's sitting watching her TV, a neighbor comes by and says, Dora, where'd you get the TV? And she tells the story of the boy. And the neighbor says, Dora, are you really that stupid? Do you really not read the papers at all? That boy is not being adopted by an American couple. He's been sold on the international market of organs. And he's probably dead by now. You've killed him. And now his organs are for sale on the international market. Well, this all happens in the first 30 minutes. What do we expect Dora to do? How do we expect the film to develop? Exactly as it does, Dora goes back, takes the next day off work, retraces her steps in an effort to rescue the boy. Before she had her eyes open, there was no moral issue. She was just doing a job. But once she had her eyes open, the ethical emerged and she had to act on that. Now, there's a willful kind of ignorance too, isn't there? Like I'm thinking of my mother, who I love my mother very much. She passed away about 15 years ago, but about 20 years ago, I was out taking care of her. She was a very privileged person, and she had broken her ankle, and I was taking care of her. And she said to me kind of innocently, she kind of knew, knew better, but she couldn't help asking. She said, uh, what is this thing I've heard called global warming? And I gave her a very mild, mild, I didn't want to scare the shit out of you, but I was like, really nice. And she gave me a long, cold look and said, well, I'm sorry I asked. Exactly. Because you asked, I told you. And because I told you, you now feel compelled to do something. And you don't want to do anything. And that's the position that we are often in as privileged people. We're often in the position of saying, I don't see it because I just can't see it. And I can't see it because I don't have to see it. That's the, the anesthetizing capacity of privilege. Privilege anesthetizes us. We have to shake ourselves awake, and then we have to act. And importantly, when we act, we should not be so sure that we've done everything right or that we're all that hot shit. We shouldn't be so sure that we're terrific. We should act contingently, humbly to a degree. We should act, but we should know that we don't know everything. And that means we should, after we act, we should doubt. We should wonder, was that the smartest thing to do? Could I have done it better? Could I have reached more people? Did I teach? Did I learn? If I didn't teach and I didn't learn, maybe it wasn't such a good action. And maybe I should rethink it. And then I have to open my eyes again, act again, and doubt again. But doubt is essential. If you don't doubt, you become dogmatic and orthodox. Do you know what I mean when I say dogmatic and orthodox? You know, do you know The Life of Brian, the wonderful movie by, um, what are those guys' names? Monty Python, The Life of Brian. It's about a reluctant messiah who doesn't want to be a messiah, but everybody makes him be the messiah. He's up on a rampart at one point in the movie, and he says to the masses below, I'm not the messiah. And they say, you're not the messiah. He says, no, no, you have minds of your own. And they all say, we have minds of our own. And one guy in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. Everybody hits him and says, shut up, you have a mind of your own. Okay, that's kind of, that's dogma, that's orthodoxy. That's having no doubt. That's, you know, that's when you're kind of sucked into the cult. And that's ideology, and it's a very dangerous thing um, in, in that regard. I'm thinking also of, I was asked to visit a Montessori school. Um, my wife had a young colleague, a lawyer, who was going to send her kids to this Montessori. You know, you've heard of the Montessori schools? So I'm in the Montessori school, and uh, it's a very nice school, and I'm looking around, and everything seems great. I'm on this tour with parents, and at the break, the parents are talking with great human, humanist psychologists, Carl Rogers and Carl Jung. And I say, apropos of that conversation, you know, Carl Jung once said, I'm glad I'm young and not a young yet, because I can still change my mind. At which point the Montessori lady said, Maria Montessori said the same thing, and I'm like, you know, it was so dogmatic, you know, it was so 
so completely kind of a tight system. Um, and that's the way, you know, it's important to remember that Marx, you know, that Jung wasn't a Jungian, Marx wasn't a Marxist, you know, you've heard this, Buddha wasn't a Buddhist, and Jesus wasn't a Christian. So it's worth remembering that because it's the followers, the dogmatists that, that kind of mess with it and, and screw it up. Um, all right. So I'll sum that up just with a, a three lines from a poem by Mary Oliver, and it's called Instructions for Living a Life. I think it's good, good instructions. And she says this, um, uh, open your eyes, be astonished, and tell about it. And that's the, the instructions for living a life. Open your eyes, be astonished, and tell about it. And I'll stop right there, thanks. <clears throat> About it, but I just wonder. You say that um, you know we shouldn't inhibit ev anything, in it, and everyone should uh, experience everything, try to know about everything, which I agree with. But then, do you think that you know what kinds of things should we inhibit? What makes something? Do you, do you believe that there are things that are wrong that that should be inhibited completely? I, I mean, I think that it's one thing to know that something is wrong and to say, okay, we want to know about it, we want to inform ourselves of what what an action what makes an action wrong, but do you do you believe in inhibiting well, any I, action? I never, and, I, stay right there. I've never thought of it quite that way, but um, but sure, I think there are things, I mean when you raise kids, for example, I think there are things you tell them um, you know, you instruct them about certain things and their life experience it teaches them certain things. For, so for example, is this working still? I can't tell, okay. Um, so for example, we tell kids, we tell kids in kindergarten, you know, when they get into a fight, we say, use your words. We try to respect their integrity. Somebody says, I'm angry. We don't say, you're not angry. Of course you're angry, but you can use your words. I will never forget being on a demonstration in San Francisco in 2003, right before the Iraq war broke out. And there was this school group demonstrating the kindergarten your kids were all wearing, carrying signs that said, George Bush, use your words, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but, but you know, yes, I think that we should tell people that they can resolve conflicts through conversation. I think we should tell children that they, um, you know, that they have to uh, take care of themselves, respect themselves and respect others, absolutely. I'm not sure what that means, though, in terms of inhibition like for you, I'm not sure what that means. What do you have in mind? Well, I just mean, do you think that there are things that are fundamentally wrong? Of that, course, of course. That sure. Even if we can can know about them, that we still should inhibit or, or as a society, try to steer away from them or, or do something to... Of course. I think all societies have laws and need laws. I think we need laws. I think we have laws and need laws that help us figure out how to be together. But those laws only make sense if they are kind of of the people and by the people. And so we do have a, lot, a whole history of law in this country that's fabulous. And I guess you could call it inhibition. We're inhibited from killing one another. And I think that's a good thing. Although that's you know circumscribed all the time um, by the powerful. They kill people all the time without you know any, I mean, for example, the illegal invasions of Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Libya. It's um, you know, those are examples of where we ought to apply the standard of no killing to our to our leaders as well. Um, and then just one more thing. You said in a democracy, uh, what we should be teaching 
you know, how we should be teaching our children and what education should be structured in a democratic society, which I agree with everything that you said, but then does that mean that every society should be democratic or should we push for every society to function as a democratic society? Um, is that saying that democracy is superior to everything or, I mean, because I, I do agree with everything that you said and, and um, I think that our educational system should strive to be that which you described, I think, um, but, you know, what does that say to other societies? You know, I, I do think that, I, I do think that um, I aspire to live in a democracy, a true democracy, a participatory democracy, an economic democracy. I aspire to that, to live in that kind of a society. And yes, I think that the fullest realization of every individual is best realized in a, in a robust participatory democracy. Do, does that mean I think we should invade um, Libya? No, I don't think that. I don't, in fact, one of the things I always find interesting about language and framing of language when they said no fly zone, didn't you get a warm, cuddly feeling like there won't be any noise overhead? And, uh, there'll be less of a carbon footprint. Oh shit, I had no idea it meant that. Well, that's, no, I don't think we should impose it, but I do think we should, I think between you and me, we should promote it. And I'll tell you what I think it means also fundamentally. I said, you know, the fullest development of each, but I think the, the radical lessons of democracy, the radical lessons of democracy are, are three. One is that you are a work in progress. Don't you feel that you're a work in progress? You don't feel you we can't write your epitaph threat yet, right? This will shock you. I'm 66 years old, I think I'm a work in progress. I don't think I'm finished. And I don't think that you can write my epitaph. And I have my mentor, I have two mentors. One is 95 <coughs> now, and one is 93. And I was out talking to my 93 year old buddy in New York a few weeks ago. And when we were finished and she was getting tired, she said, you know, I better get some rest because I have a lot to do. I thought, right on, 93, she has a lot to do. So if you think you're a work in progress, remember everyone around you is a work in progress too. Every one of us is trying to lean forward. That's how we live our lives. We have plans, we have projects, we have things we have to do. And my 93-year-old friend has a kind of a a slogan that she often says, and that is, I am what I am not yet. I am what I am not yet. So I'm still evolving. And I think that's how we should see our lives, and that's what we should teach our children. You are not a stereotype. You're not just this or just that. Don't believe in any inflamed identity that you could give yourself. I'm black, or I'm old, or I'm a woman, or I'm gay. That's one thing you are, and you're so much more. And the idea of inflaming any single part of your identity and having it stand for the all that you are is a mistake. We are a work in progress. Let's teach our children that they are a work in progress and that they should respect all the universes around them who are themselves works in progress. And the second thing we should convince ourselves of is that we're living in history. This is harder to prove to you, but it is true. We are living in history. History is <coughs> plunging forward. And what we do or don't do will make a difference. By not doing anything, you're allowing the kind of status quo to be the status quo. Howard Zinn had that wonderful book called You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. The train is moving. If you're neutral, you're not doing anything. And that means the train's plowing right over the edge. So you can't be neutral on a moving train. We're living in history. Get involved, get engaged with your fellow students, your fellow human beings, and do something. Or as uh, Mary Oliver would have it, write about it. So those are two of the radical lessons of democracy in my mind. Thank you for asking that. Anybody else? Okay, if, we, if people want to start, uh, maybe calling, getting in line, I'm so they can kind of get a move on. Uh, and you can ask one question. <clears throat> Hello, Professor. My name is Ivan Ramos. I'm a community member, and um, I enjoyed your talk. I. Um, my question has to do with schools and school systems. Um, you know, we have communities that have and communities that have much less, as you mentioned. And um, you, you have parents who work very, very hard and they want to do the best for their children and they feel that what they have is what they have. And you have other families and schools that are not in that great a position. And my question to you is how how do you, how do we as a society move on those people 
that are in the position of having, how do we move upon them to say, you need to share, you need to, you need to make something greater without doing it in, in, a, in a way that's revolutionary necessarily, that you know, we're not killing people or, or impounding people or, or making people move when they don't want to live. Is that a clear question? Yeah, I understand what you're saying and I appreciate it. Um, the how is, is the hardest question. If you recognize the disparities, and the disparities, you know, the disparities in this country are phenomenal, and in the world are phenomenal. <clears throat> so two quick things that we should notice. One is that there's a big article in Vanity Fair this month about the fact that 1% of Americans control over 50% of the wealth in this country. And that, that figure is changed in the last 20 years. It used to be, 14% controlled 33% of the wealth. Now it's 1% with over 50% of the wealth. That's an untenable situation. That's a situation like the golden age of, of the robber barons. That's a situation that is going to, we're here we are kind of all noting and celebrating or being amazed at the Arab Spring. And one of the causes of the Arab Spring was the vast disparities between the oligarchs with all their wealth and the masses who had nothing couldn't even get a good job, even though they were educated and smart. I don't know how many of you are terrified about the, the hostile job market you're facing, but if I were you, I'd be plenty terrified and then pissed off. Um, you know, but, but so, yes, the disparities are something we should note. And then we should do two things. We should agitate, we should organize, we should act. We, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about us, you know, sometimes I was gonna, you know, 2003, we illegally invaded and occupied Iraq. By 2000, by, was it 2003? Yeah, and by 2006, a majority of Americans opposed the war. And that was with a steady stream of jingoism and patriotism and you know nonsensical stuff that we couldn't get away from. And yet, a majority, I wanted to write a book called We're Not That Stupid. You know, we may be stupid, but we're not that stupid. And I would argue the same thing around education. With all the debate that's going on and the noisy voices have control of the dialogue and making all the points about privatizing the schools and that this is the way to go in the future, like privatizing <coughs> healthcare was so brilliant, you know? So privatize the schools. And yet, majorities of people in Chicago, in Cleveland, in LA, in New York, want a revitalized, re-energized, re-cultured, re-thought, public school system. So I think we're not that stupid. I think we have to speak up, we have to speak with a unified voice, we have to persuade, and that's the way we should always be thinking. How do I get evidence and then argument? How do I make an argument that makes this make sense? And I think there's no formula for it, but I guess I guess I just say one other thing. There's no formula for it, which means that we should all be pounding away in our own Backyards, and I think that one of the things that's discouraging about us as political people, as a political nation, is that we spend way, way, way too much time looking at the sites of power we don't have access to. The White House, the Congress, the Pentagon, Wall Street. But we don't spend enough time looking at the power we have absolute access to. The community, the street, the community organization, the school, the classroom. That's where you guys have potential power but you spend, all of us, spend too much time saying things like, I wish President Obama would end the war. And my response to that is always the same. What have you done today to end the war? What did you do to build the organization that's gonna get the attention? Remember, Lyndon Johnson passed the most far-reaching civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, and he was not part of the Black Freedom Movement. He was a cracker from Texas. And, and FDR was a patrician from upstate New York. He was not a union member. And Abraham Lincoln never belonged to an abolitionist party. Why do we, we remember those three great presidents for those great accomplishments? And the answer is there were movements on the ground. And that's the, where you have the possibility of living and being. And that's what I would encourage you to do. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming out here to speak with us. Thank you. Um, I think you bring up a lot of great points and you're a very intelligent speaker. But I gotta be honest with you, listening to you talk, this is straight out of Chicago politics here. You 
I'm saying what appeals to the masses, you talk about change, you talk about the Constitution, yes, everybody wants that. But you also belong to an organization which bombed government buildings, killed innocent people, also provided disability, permanent disability, to people for your cause, including Vietnam veterans. Now, myself being an Iraq war vet, I take this very personal because they were the first ones to welcome us home. They were the first ones to stand outside the funeral and talk to us about doing the right thing, yet you blow up buildings and killed innocent people. is the vets are very, very divided, and the, the most exciting group to me, and the group I work very closely with, is the Iraq Veterans Against the War. And they are a powerful, powerful organization, and they really are the heart and soul of the anti-war movement. So, you know, the, to me, the, the, you know, the, the anti-war position is a position that says you should never have to have gone there. There was no reason for you to go, and the powerful don't go, and you shouldn't have had to go, but never mind. We don't agree about that. The facts that you have about the Weather Underground, I have no question that a lot of you would find the Weather Underground a group that was illegal, that was, you know, uh, did illegal actions, that uh, destroyed property, that crossed lines of legality and maybe even common sense. And, and as some people have said, we did despicable things. That was 45 years ago. I, I, we never killed anybody. And we answered, each of us answered in uh, courts of law for what we did. And I've been, you know, above ground for 40 years and doing, you know, what I do. So that that's, you've got the facts wrong, but, you know, I would urge you to, you know, look beyond Fox News. There's some, you know, that's uh. <laughs> There's a sense that Chicago politics is about, you know, um, uh, kind of backroom deals, and which I don't adhere to or believe in. It's about Mayor Daley and Rahm Emanuel, neither of whom I particularly like or support. Um, but the other thing is, there's this sense, this argument that's going to go on, and I think you all should be armed for this argument. There's this argument going on right now about the role of government. And one side says, um, you know, government, uh, you know, big, big government, we're against big government. So I was speaking in Georgia, and the Tea Party came and sat in the front row. They were actually all Hell's Angels, but they were wearing Tea Party jackets, and the head of the Tea Party stood up and said what this gentleman just said, that he thought I was um, okay speaker and intelligent, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna put that on the back of my book or on my resume or something, thank you. But then he said, I, I worry that you're a big government guy, and I said, I'm not a big government guy. And I said, what makes you think that? I'm not a big government guy, and I'm certainly not a big corporation guy. I said to him, are you in favor of General Electric making $14.7 billion and paying no taxes? The, the, the cartoonist who did the comic book with me made $12,000 last year and paid $800 in taxes. And General Electric paid nothing in taxes. That's big government and big corporations in cahoots. And guess who they're against? You. They're squeezing ordinary people in order to have that kind of wealth get off tax-free. And then President Obama turns around and appoints the head of General Electric to be the head of his jobs program. What are we thinking? I mean, where are we? So no, I'm not in favor of big government. And I said to this Hells Angel Tea Party guy, um, in fact, I'd like to cut the Pentagon to nothing. And he said, what? They're not the Pentagon. He said, don't touch the Pentagon. I said, well, then you're the big government guy. You know, because that's the debate. Every government on earth, all they do is tax and spend. Tax and spend, tax and spend. Who do you want to tax and what do you want to spend on? That's where we should have the debate.
not about, you know, so here's Paul Ryan putting forward a budget and President Obama putting forward a, a vision, and neither one of them is talking about taxing the rich. I want them to tax the rich. I want to not spend a trillion dollars a year on the military. We've already sunk a trillion dollars into Afghanistan and Iraq. That's ridiculous. Given the needs that we have and given the fact that we could live as a country among countries in this world, but no, we gotta spend a trillion dollars invading two countries and a trillion dollars a year on military. Let's argue about that. I wanna spend on higher education, public education, health, those kinds of things, and let's argue about that, not big government or no government. In fact, those Hells Angels got to my talk by riding on that socialist road, I-70. <laughs> <laughs> Why history is so important? Because people need to get it fucking accurate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, so people need to get it accurate. It's right. Because if you watch the documentary, if you read the books, you would know that no one was killed. No one was murdered whatsoever. And I think that history is so important here. And I can't stress enough. I mean, this is one of the reasons why uh, there's so much racism. There's so much sexism, so on and so forth, because of inaccuracy. So I think people need to get it right. That's, that's my thing. Okay, Mika, let me say about the Freedom Schools quickly. Um, one of the great, great books um, out right now is by Charles Payne. It's called Teach Freedom. And it's got some stuff in there about the Freedom Schools of the 60s and the Freedom Schools today. They do exist in different forms. The introduction of that collection is by Charlie Cobb, the guy I mentioned. <laughs> And he makes the most brilliant argument about why freedom schools are needed today more than they were needed back then. That is schools that encourage people to become politically slash socially literate and ask questions of the universe. And so check out that book, Teach Freedom by Charles Payne. There are a lot of them around today. Some are exactly as they were back then and some are little knockoffs, but, but they're worth looking at. Thanks, Mika. Yes, sir. By the way, what time is it? I don't want to... Greg? 1019. Don't you guys have to study? Is <laughs> 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 this a college? My homes are too weak. Don't you have to go get high or something? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two quick questions. One, I want to know why you were, weren't more outspoken about how improperly you were portrayed by the right-wing media during the Obama election. Okay. And secondly, why doesn't the ball bounce? <laughs> you, you did that just to get me because it's interesting. That was asked of me 40 years ago, and I still don't know why. I actually had a physicist try to explain it to me, and I'm going to say something about those little kids asking questions. Um, yeah.